Hello and welcome back to Cinematic Venom. I'm Superman. And we need to talk. Over the years, I have been the subject of some very harsh criticism in regards to my feature films and, you know, how much better Batmans are. Although the first two are pretty much praised by the vast majority, the third is when reviews start to get nasty. During the production of the second film, director Richard Donner was actually fired and replaced mid-production, leading to lead actress Margot Kidder unleashing her rage on the producers for their treatment of him. This resulted in allegedly, we'll get to that, Margot's role in the third film being reduced greatly. Lead star Christopher Reeve also refused to return for a third film because A, he was also furious at the treatment of Donna, and B, he thought that the script was absolute garbage. Ouch. That's a shame. With Reeve not returning, the production went ahead anyway, the studio choosing to recast. John Travolta was offered it but turned it down. Thank God. Will you stop interrupting? Jeff Bridges and Kurt Russell also rejected offers, and Tony Danza was finally cast just days before filming began. However, director Richard Lester hated this plan and literally begged Reeve to return, and he only agreed if he could make adjustments to the script himself, which the producers allowed. Comedian Richard Pryor, who starred as a result of a joke, by the way. Richard Pryor later admitted, however, in his autobiography, that he thought that the screenplay was absolutely terrible and he only agreed to do it because he was paid $5 million. This is sounding awesome so far. Uh-oh. Gene Hackman was also approached to reprise his role as Lex Luthor, but he turned it down, showing no interest. Oh, sure, but Superman 4, that's a winner. I really don't understand you. He compared it to a slasher series with the bad guy constantly coming back, but Kidder, Reeve, and Pryor were all unhappy with the end result of the film. So much so, Reeve flat out said that he was done with the character and there was no chance in hell that he would ever return to it after that. He slated the cheesy comedy. When I saw Richard Pryor go off the top of a building wearing a pink tablecloth on skis, I thought, whoops. <laughs> we boo booed here. We, we, we here. <laughs> and despite claims that he had control over the script, in interviews it doesn't really seem to be the case. Yeah, I was into it except for part three. I mean, I think part three, I thought, you know, I had nothing to do with part three other than, you know, when, when they wrote the script, I showed up and gave it my all, but I was. I had problems with my house. Reeve did, however, state that the first two films were also originally intended to be coated with the comedy that littered the third. It's not going to make him want to pick up a gun. Right. I mean, so you're learning thing. the difference in good and evil, and I think that's pretty positive. Do you know that in a Superman film, not one person dies? Not one person dies. Perhaps somebody in part one, but not, not thereafter. In part four, nobody dies. Yep. No one. Seriously, why is it such a big deal when somebody dies in Man of Steel? I mean, in some interviews he praises Richard Pryor's comedy in the film, in others he slates it, so it's unsure what he actually felt. Richard Pryor is in this with you, isn't he? Oh, that? is he ever? He's yeah. great. Yeah. He's wonderful. So we open with Gus, played by Pryor, in an unemployment line getting rejected welfare, and then we cut to... Oh boy. The beginning of the fan's fury. That could be dangerous, Jimmy. These opening titles. Just... Just these opening titles. To this day, this is the one and only one of my films to not feature the traditional John Williams Superman theme. And instead, we get this comedy sketch opening that looks more like the Three Stooges took over the writing team. I mean, there's cartoony slapstick and just pretty much everything goes wrong in just these first few minutes. Paint can, hijinks, really forced blind man joke, mime, burning penguin. Sure. Clark then blows out in pure sight of everyone and nobody bats an eye. Sure. A car even crashes into a fire hydrant, which then allows it to fill with water. That's how they work. Sure. Well, that's easy to say, but how? So I show up to save the day, and despite being faster than the speed of light, a photo booth somehow manages to photograph my change of clothes. Fun fact for you, this is actually baby Superman from the first film. See, I know some things too. Now the thing is, as bizarre, cheesy, and forced as this opening is, and don't get me wrong, it's all of those things. I mean, it sucks hard. But it really does set the tone for the rest of the film. Say what you want about Superman 3, it's very self-aware in what it's trying to be. I do actually think the film does get a lot more intelligent than people give it credit for, which we'll get onto later. It knows it's goofy, it knows it's cheesy, it knows it's silly, and I like that it's self-aware. Whereas the next two films would try to be inspiring and intelligent, but they just sucked balls hard. Superman's bad. So we cut back to Gus, who now has... some... computer job. 
What? The last time we saw him, he was in an unemployment line as a bum. Don't call me a bum. I'm not a bum. And now we somehow got this computer job that would require like qualifications and there's no explanation whatsoever. And the funny thing is, he actually sucks at this job. Good Lord. How did you do that? I don't know. I just did it. Truly, some of Metropolis's finest working here. The fun's just starting. So Gus starts suspiciously working after hours before we cut to Clark and Jimmy on a bus ride to Smallville where a chemical plant containing acid is ablaze. Clark gets chased in the back of a cop car who doesn't even notice. I is everyone just immune to vision in this film? I mean, nobody sees him blow out a flaming penguin. Can't believe I just said that. Nobody spots him changing slowly in photo booths. Nobody sees him getting chased in the back of a cop car. How do you know about that? Through the magic of sight. So after Borat here gives me some exposition about the acid and the fact that it only becomes dangerous once it heats up. Gee, I wonder if this is going to come into play at some point later on in the film. You catch on fast, old buddy. I'll decide to head off to a nearby lake, freeze it and carry the coat of ice over in a god-awful CGI effect to drop it over the plant, turning it into rain and saving the day. We'll just pretend that that would work. Yeah, it's fine. Do you realize what we're on to? In Smallville, Clark clearly has gotten over Lois fairly quickly because at our high school reunion, he meets back up with his teenage sweetheart Lana, played by Annette O'Toole. Now, this is where the conflicting reports about Lois begin. You see, Margot Kidder claimed that her outburst on the set of Superman 2 was the reason that her role was reduced, but the producers wholeheartedly denied this and stated that Clark and Lois broke up at the end of 2 and therefore there would be no reason for Lois to have a bigger role in this one. If they did me and Lois again, it would grow repetitive and her continuing to be the love interest just would not have made any any sense, and I agree with this point. It is the most logical. Yeah, that never occurred to me. So during his time with Lana, we find out that Clark's mother died. When? When was this? You think that they show a devastating moment in Clark's life like that? You know, show the downfall of his character, but nah, nah, FYI, mum croaked, yes, yeah, cool. Oh. I'm sorry. We then cut to Bruce Wayne, I mean some billionaire called Ross Webster, played by the late great Robert Vaughan, owner of the company that Gus is working for, who discovers that he's been hacking into their system to steal an awful lot of money from him and the company. Now the logical solution will be to fire him, you know, get the, the police involved, try to get your money back, sue him maybe, and just, just, that's not what happens, is it? You know, you get your way all the time. And it's not right. No, Webster instead calls Gus to his office where he says he admires his integrity and offers him a promotion for even more money. That makes sense. You know, I have to say, a lot of criticism for the film was Richard Pryor just being painfully unfunny, but so far he's nothing short of hilarious. You didn't tell me your mother was going to be here. I'm his sister, his baby sister. Why would the boss want to see me? There's no reason. Nobody. Oh, I know! It's my suggestion for the volleyball uniforms. Listen, I know that you're a man of compassion and you have pity, and I don't want to go to jail because they have robbers and rapists and rapists who rape robbers. Whoops. <laughs> we boo booed we, here. We, we booed here. <laughs> so Webster informs Gus that he wants to buy Columbia's coffee, but the douchebags refused. So in order to show them, he has Gus hack a satellite dish to control the weather to cause a tornado storm. Stop! Stop, stop. Just stop right there. Just take in what I just said. Let's go down the list. First of all, this is not how weather works. For such a high budget feature film, you'd think they'd understand the basic conception of scientific weather. Secondly, how would this even get him the coffee? In the next scene, he brags that it worked and the coffee is his. But how? Did he threaten to give them a tsunami by hacking their Skype? You know something? You're a genius. Third, I show up to prevent the storm from doing too much damage, which is what leads to Webster and his crew wanting to kill me. It's such a forced reason for them to hold a grudge against me, but actually, I kind of dig it. Once you get past the forced reasons, I like that it's something different. I mean, sure, it's still the bad guys trying to take over the world and become rich, but it's at least a unique motive for the time and something very different to the previous two films. Say what you want here, but at least Superman 3 tried something different and took risks. And unlike part four, I don't think it's stupid as hell. Only slightly stupid. Sometimes. And also, Webster has an awesome screen presence, and although I don't think he matches Gene Hackman, he has some awesome lines. It is not enough that I succeed. Everyone else must fail. During all of this, Clark has been spending time in Smallville with Lana and her son Ricky. Now, a lot of people's issues was also that this film felt too cluttered. There's an awful lot going on, and it would only get more and more cramped as the film progresses, but it's no more than Superman 2. In that one, I went off and was spending time with Lois for half the film while the villains terrorised Metropolis. And here, it's exactly the same scenario, really. What is it only a problem in this one? And the thing is, in the last two films, it was obvious that Lois loved the superhero and not Clark. They even acknowledge it with... I think maybe we ought to hire a bodyguard from now on. <laughs> I don't want a bodyguard. I want the man I fell in love with. I know that, Lois. 
But I wish you were here. I mean, I love the relationship, but she fell for Superman and not Clark Kent. Whereas here, Lana genuinely loves Clark for who he is. Christopher Reeve also intentionally changed his performance for these reasons. Yeah, I've, I've changed some things about Clark Kent the third time. Annette O'Toole, who's a wonderful actress, plays Lana Lang, uh, starts to like Clark. You know, Clark's gotten sort of lost in the shuffle over the years. And as a result, I decided, look, she's a pretty girl and a bright girl, and she can't be attracted to a moron. So Clark is going to have to loosen up a little bit and not a little less with this and a little less bumping into the walls, only bump into the wall every other time, but not every time. And it's been nice to play the man who would have grown up in Kansas. She loves him for the person he is, so much so I actually hit on her at one point and get rejected. So in a way, Clark and Lana is a much more touching love story than Clark and Lois ever were. She loves him without his powers. Uh, not that he has any powers, I'm not Clark. Stick around, you might learn something. In addition, Lana has a bitter, I guess, ex-boyfriend or just a dude who fancies her, who tries to patronise Ricky but Clark makes him look awesome in front of his mates. He saves him from being sliced to pieces. I really like the way these relationships are developed upon. So we cut to Gus who has to hack more computers, which just so happen to be in Smallville, which just so happens to be where Lana's crazy ex works and they have a bit of a drinking game. There's not a vodka in it. There's no vodka in it! <laughs> See, you people drink normal. These people drink, have a couple of drinks, feel fine. Social drinking. Yeah. yeah. Me, I couldn't stop drinking until the bartender and go, We got no more liquor! <laughs> this leads to a Monty Python-like montage of ATMs going berserk, traffic lights messing up roads, people's money going missing. There's even a part where the little men on the traffic light signals have an animated fight. Come on! I mean, I know it's goofy, I know it's silly, but at least they're having fun with it. Hello, hello, hello. Oh man, we've got a comic book movie here trying to have fun! Thank you, brother. So this is where the bad guys realise I stopped their plan and even turned a goddamn tornado upside down and their real evil plot is about to begin. Why stop at coffee? Right, Susan, you're not a Bond villain. Gus reveals that my only weakness is kryptonite, but... Kryptonite? I remember reading about it in an interview with him. Wait, what? Why would I reveal this in an interview? And then, this is where Pryor gets really hard to defend. And it landed right in the middle of this big plantation. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Right? And he looked, checked everything out, right, with his x-ray vision before he did that. And then he put these laser beams out of his eyes onto everything. Straight out laser beams. Dried up everything. Just like that. I'm talking about dried it up like the machines that they have in the men's rooms. You know what I'm talking about? The hot air comes out and you put your hands under there and you dry them off. Sometimes they don't work, right? But Superman's work! This is one of the greatest stand-up comedians of all time, kids. Meanwhile, I decide to attend Ricky's birthday party. Now you may be thinking, Superman, shouldn't you be out saving the world? Gus soon shows up and... Oh god, he deserves the Razzie for this scene alone. I just came in directly from the Pentagon, and you better believe there's a damn good reason that I did. Because God has given us one of the greatest gifts in the world. So he used the computers to find some kryptonite or something, and then he hands me it, which I don't even react to, to show how badass I am. This is a small token of our appreciation to show to you for saving us from a chemical plant disaster. Uh, Richard, this isn't even red. Now I don't have to tell you! No, 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 dude, uh, this isn't, this is nothing. We cannot afford a chemical plastics gap! This is literally doing nothing. Do you want our president of the United States? You never read a comic book? Like, like, literally, look, I'll probably be eating this later. So, yeah, this is clearly in reference to the comic books where a particular version of Kryptonite doesn't kill me, but instead just turns me evil. The problem? That's supposed to be red! Good God, this film can't even differentiate red and green kryptonite. It's just a tiny goddamn detail that wouldn't have been particularly difficult to fix, you morons. But oh no, Webster isn't too happy with these events. I ask you to kill Superman, and you're telling me you couldn't even do that one simple thing. Uh, killing Superman isn't exactly a, a simple thing. That's like saying, I ask you to defy gravity whilst doing a handstand blindfolded and avoiding bombs in a minefield. 
one arm tied behind your back. And you couldn't do that one simple thing. Thank you, one, don't you? So then, okay, seriously, I should be out saving people. What the hell am I doing? So I'm chilling with Lana when the negative effects of the red, not so red, green, supposed to be red, 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 reading really goddamn comic book, red is supposed to be red, kryptonite, take place, and honestly, after three films of being Mr. Perfect, this is actually really well done. The music, which by the way, I have no idea how it was nominated for a Razzie, though prior, I can easily see why. I just came in directly from- SHUT UP! <laughs> but the music adds to the tension and it makes you feel so awkward and uncomfortable, which is exactly what the scene should do. Are you sure you shouldn't do something about the bridge? What bridge? You're right. So after being cock blocked, I head off to finally save the bridge, but it's far too late. What can I do to help? Not much of anything now. If only you'd got here a minute sooner. Sorry, I was trying to wet my dick tonight. We're in big trouble, aren't we? And here's another major problem. Things get worse and I start to turn evil. Now this is a really cool idea, but it's just not handled very well, which Christopher Reeve echoed himself. I think the premise though of Superman turning evil sounds great. In mm -hmm. fact, the first scene we shot in that picture was the confrontation in the junkyard. Mm -hmm. And I actually thought that could be a terrific scene. That's, that's a nice idea, but... Even what, Superman gets to stretch. Yeah, no, but I thought, I thought that that's great. What happens if all this, this, this power was turned to evil? In fact, that was my premise. I, I suggested that to the writers. Now, he nails this performance. His acting is great, and it does make you upset to see Superman as this evil douchebag. But the problem is, he doesn't even do anything nasty. Jesus Christ, this is the best they could come up with for evil soups? Seriously, I fix the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which apparently makes everybody fuming at me. I blow out the Olympic torch. I find Marilyn Monroe on top of the Statue of Liberty, and she convinces me to help steal some oil from a ship in exchange for sex. My motivation is pussy. Evil Superman does bad things to get laid. This doesn't even fit with my character. Why would I listen to her? I'm goddamn Superman. Why would I need to do anything to get laid? A naughty genius, but what the hell? Nobody's perfect, right? I mean, in Superman 1, the villains sent missiles to destroy all of California. In Superman 2, the bad guys terrorized the entire country, causing destruction to everything in their path, destroying famous landmarks, humiliating the president, blowing people to smithereens. And in Superman 3, he fixes a tower and blows out a torch. I mean, these are more like what a 10 year old does to get attention. The only genuinely horrid thing he does here is to steal some damn oil and he does that to get his pee pee moist. And the thing is, we don't even really see the public react to this. He doesn't save the bridge in time, then he fixes the tower and we're just told that he's gone bad, but we never actually see the outrage or heartbreak from the public, which would be really emotional to see. After two and a half films, shouldn't we see this transition more? A lot of people also hated that this film already had a lot going on in it and them adding the turn of Superman only made the problem worse. But guess what? It was almost a lot worse. What? Originally, anti-hero Mr. McMillipook... McMillipook... My name is Mitzi Spickley. Thank you. Was supposed to appear played by Dudley Moore. Super villain Brainiac was also to be involved and Supergirl as my cousin, which would then lead into her spin-off movie a year later. So consider yourselves lucky for what we got. So after stealing the oil, I'll visit Monroe's place. How'd she get back down? I mean, I couldn't have flown her down because I'll say, Well, I hope you don't expect me to save you because I don't do that anymore. In fact, how'd she get up there? I mean, I, I guess Webster's rich and could have gotten a helicopter up there, but like she's at the top and everyone's looking up at her, so they saw her up there, so wouldn't people have seen Webster like drop her off and stuff? Oh, you know, who cares? But that's not the issue because then I get laid, and my question has always been, How can I have sex with a human being? I mean, I'm superhuman. One thrust should tear her in half. And Jesus, imagine if I busted a load inside her. Bloody skyrocket out of space. Okay, ready? And just to show how nasty and evil I am, I go to a bar to get drunk. One, are they saying alcohol is evil? Two, would alcohol even affect me? What are you looking at? Huh? I've officially transitioned into a 10 year old child. Yeah, please, go on, chicken. Absolutely. And then we get the most famous and iconic scene of the entire movie. I fly to a junkyard where I split in two and fight Clark Kent. Even though I'm not Clark Kent. Alright, um, it was a weird decision on the part of the writers. The fight only lasts around six minutes, but the special effects for two Christopher Reeves are absolutely terrific. Although, evil Superman talks in a really exaggerated New York accent for some reason now. Are they saying New York is evil? What's the matter, Kent? Too warm for you, huh? Hey, bada bing, bada boom, get the kryptonite out of here! You always wanted to fly, Kent. Now's your chance. But he can. 
Like, he knows he's Clark's... Wait, no, I'm not. The fight is pretty solid. This is clearly a metaphor for the director crushing the franchise. There are some strange parts, though, like when Clark throws tires around me and I just stand there without reacting, and it ends with him strangling me to kill me. Even though I can breathe in space. What the hell is going on? Now, as much lack of logic people can throw at this scene, it has its positives and it has its negatives. Firstly, I like the evil Superman angle, and yeah, I've covered how they mishandled it, but I also feel it should have taken up more of the movie to truly feel the struggle. However, this scene is great because it's a visual metaphor for his fight between Clark and Superman. Whoops. It's a visual interpretation of his inner battle, whilst also in conflict over the fact that Lana loves Clark and Lois loved the Man of Steel. I think it's cleverly put together and he had to differentiate between the two. I think it's well done, I just think it should have been developed upon more is all. Anyway, now I've put back on my good boy pants. You wake up in the morning, sir, put on my big boy pants! I'll blow the oil back into the ship, because that's how liquids work. Sure. What is that? Well, the villain set up camp in a cave with Gus's newly designed supercomputer that finds anybody's weakness. Wait till Superman finds us. Then you'll see some fun. Wait a minute, you're gonna mess with Superman? Yes! Yes, actually, for the past 95 minutes, yes! Where have you been? In fact, why did you think you were building this whole computer anyway? Okay, sir. What do you need? I need the absolute best master computer you could design. Yeah, got it. It must have perfect defenses. Okay, De defenses against what? Dark arts. What? Uh, nothing. I need this computer to be able to find anybody's weakness and use it against them to cause unimaginable pain. That seems a bit suspicious. Just do okay. it! Okay, yeah, that was fine. And while you're at it, look in space for kryptonite. What the hell is kryptonite? Alright, alright, I got it. So as I approach the Pratt cave, Brits will get that joke. Yeah. Webster plays a game that even in 1983 looks better than Superman 64 in 1999 where he shoots some poorly designed cardboard missiles at me. I soon show up but they decide to burst my bubble. It's very good. Now, people have actually defended this, saying that the bubble is made out of kryptonite and that's what's hurting me. But my problem with this theory is... <laughs> Let's see how long you can carry on without any air. I'm an alien. I can breathe in space! And this is the second time in this movie my oxygen's been, been cut off. It is not my fault. After Gus decides to pull the plug, the computer takes on a life of its own and feeds off the city's electricity, and this is where the film really does go dark. Yes? That scared the hell out of me as a kid. And it, it still kinda does. During this madness, I decided to run away like a pussy, but I'll soon return with some of that acid stuff. What a surprise. I had to fix it myself. And take down the machine to save the day. I become good mates with Gus, refer him to a job, and he still says no. What a douche. Have you ever seen Superman before? I... Uh, no. Oh, you don't know about me and him? <laughs> me and Superman? <laughs> how would, uh, how would Gus know that, that, that Clark opens his shirt like that to show the, uh, I mean, I'm not Clark, shut up. I mean, it's a nice little gag, but it doesn't make any sense, so I'm just going to assume it was an ad-lib and they kept it in. I don't think you could ever be a nuisance to me. And here's the thing, as if Lana wasn't likeable enough already, Clark goes to dinner with her and Ricky and claims that Superman couldn't make it, and they're over the moon, so happy to have him instead. Take notes, Lois. So I'll fix the Leaning Tower of Pisa, because that was the true crisis of this picture. Whoops. You know, we boo-booed here. We, we, we boo here. <laughs> Everybody goes back to work and peace returns to the world. Why don't I take you to lunch and you can tell me all about it? I'd love to, but the director won't let you have any other scenes. Lana even gets a job at the Daily Planet, but for whatever reason didn't return for Superman 4 and was never once even acknowledged in the film. The thing is, how cool would it have been if she was? Lois loved Superman and Lana loved Clark. Imagine the dilemmas of him literally leading two relationships at the same time. Imagine if both were in danger and he'd have to decide between the two. This would predate Batman Forever and that would have created this cliche first. It would have actually made Superman 3 even better and even more important, sitting in the middle of him leaving Lois and starting a new love with Lana leading into the conflict of four. But now it's just an unknown mystery of what could have been. Good, that's why I keep you around. As for Superman 3, I really like it. 
Lana is absolutely wonderful and she and Clark have such great chemistry, it really is a charming love story. As much as I adore Lois in the first two, it was based on superficiality and the charm seemed to vanish once he lost his powers, but those never mattered to Lana. The villains, I enjoy. They had a different motive and although sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, it's unique and at least an attempt at trying something new. Richard Pryor is only annoyingly unfunny in two scenes, but his character actually has a lot of substance behind him. He's not just a bad guy, he's a good guy at heart who makes some bad decisions, he's actually quite unique. He's not your cliche stereotypical bad guy, he's actually got a lot of depth to him. The special effects are a bit off once or twice, the evil stuff is handled poorly but I love Reeve's portrayal and I think despite its cheesy and goofy approach, it's self aware and I see no problem with that. It's silly but it's fun. But weirdly this film was apparently so bad Christopher Reeve refused to ever star in another one again. Is there going to be a Superman 4? Uh, this is this is where we get out the violins. No, I've got my diploma now and yeah. um, uh, they're going to put me out the pasture. You're hanging up the cape and tights, are you? Yeah. Well, there's been so much written about the fact Chris Reeve says this is the third Superman movie, and I'm not going to do any more Superman movies. I'm going to do something else now. But there's a good reason for that. And it has less to do with my image than really, I think, having a little bit of respect for the public. If you ask me, and I'll really get in trouble here, but I think the first couple of times out, like with the Bond movies for me, it's Dr. No, Goldfinger, and From Russia With Love. Everything after that is pale by comparison, to say the least. And I would like to, <clears throat> excuse me, not have that downslide with Superman is to make three movies that were carefully worked on, that were really well thought out, and then say, you know, it's been nice so long. And three is the last time he'll play the Man of Steel. However, he came back for four, which was a giant pile of crap, but after that, he was suddenly open for a fifth installment, which never happened. So you have left the door open, I guess, this time a little more for five, if there's some reason to do it creatively or otherwise. Exactly. But he confessed to having a lot of control over the script for Superman 4, so really, he's to blame. How can you bitch about three and then make one that's infinitely worse? And he helped with direction, he helped with the character, he helped with the screenplay. Christopher Reeve is the reason Superman 4 was so awful. And astonishingly, he seemed to disown three far more than four. Four was just a nonsensical, poorly edited, poorly acted, atrocious mess that tried to be something it wasn't, which is something I can't say for the third one. It may be a little cluttered, but it's a damn fun viewing experience. And that's what movies are all about. <laughs> Your movies suck. They're absolutely terrible. Like Superman 3, Superman 4, they're terrible. Oh, I'm the Man of Steel. I'm the Man of Steel. <laughs> Your films are terrible. Like, oh my god. Like, seriously, Richard Pryor. They're, they're, your films are awful. They're so gay. They're gay soups. <laughs> oh, look at me. Look at me. Quest for peace. Nuclear bombs. <laughs> and, oh my god. Nothing. Nothing is worse than Superman 4. <laughs> you got Batman and Robin. Okay, you win.